So good morning. I think so I presume most of you guys are based in the United States. So I would say first good morning to all of you. I heard, I understood that a lot of you live in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Uh, I've been there many, many times, many, many, many times to Atlanta, Georgia here. Buckhead used to be where we used to live actually most of the time. Um, so nice to connect with people from a familiar region in the United States. Uh, I will tell a little bit about myself in the presentation itself. So I'll just go straight to that. Uh, All right, so give you a share. One second, let me see if I've given you the share access. Oh, yeah. You had to give it to me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I will go off the video. You can be on the video. Can you see the screen now? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Thank you. All right. So here we go. So the session is about end of life planning. Let me start by saying why that name. A lot of people say that name sounds very depressive. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just to, to be to to some extent it has intentionally written that way because it is not a very not a very non-depressive topic, but it's a very important topic. And I wanted to catch people's attention with a topic that is somewhat shocking. That people understand that this is something that we need to do. So it's an information sharing session. Uh, my name is Vish Vishwanathan, uh, originally born in Chennai. I currently run a boutique uh, management consulting firm in Dallas, Texas and Chennai. I also run an alumni group or a, a college angel, alumni angel group in, in uh, Sunnyvale, California. We have about 75 investors. We primarily invest in uh, startups in the US, India and elsewhere. So just a few disclaimers. Since I'm presenting to a U.S. audience, I had to say a lot of disclaimers uh, to say that I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a certified financial advisor. I'm not a certified tax professional. I'm not an insurance agent. I'm not an estate planner. I'm not an employee of any government. So there. Uh, this, this information is intended to share my learning. Uh, as Shankaran pointed out, I had the uh, opportunity and I would say that maybe a mis misfortune of having to work with people who were in a very difficult state after the loss of their uh, the loved one. And so I put my learning so that we can use it to prevent um, other people going through the same experience. So it's a, it's, a, it's not a legal document or expert advice. It's basically my own learnings. And most of the information I'm presenting here is compiled from of course, own experiences as well as other publicly available information from US and India government websites, et cetera. I'm doing this as a pro bono service. It is not supported, sponsored, or paid by anyone. And uh, Along the presentation, uh, if you if you need to know, if you want to do this uh, exercise for yourself and you're looking for some professional advice, I'm happy to refer the service providers that I use for my own purpose, both in the US as well as in India. However, I don't have any referral agreement with them, so you're free to talk to them and engage them as you deem fit. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, so I just want to leave this slide here. Uh, mainly what I had to convey here is that I lived about two decades in the United States. I studied there in the US, uh, in New York, and then lived in uh, upstate New York and in uh, Bay Area, and then most of the time in Dallas, Texas. Uh, worked for a company called American Airlines for a while, and then Sabre. And, uh, and then after that, I ran a couple of uh, publicly and privately listed companies in the US. The public limited company was listed in NASDAQ. It's an IT product and services company. Uh, I'm a board member now, advisor, mentor, and uh, currently running my own boutique management consulting firm. I had the opportunity in my career to travel to 88 countries all over the world. So very, very proud and very uh, blessed to have been to many countries. Travel to actually means you have to go there, stay there, work there with people there and do business there. So I had the opportunity to do it in 88 countries. I'm also an accredited angel investor with the Chennai Angels, Gindi Angels, and Native Lead Angels. I've uh, been a Thai charter member and a Thai board member for three consecutive terms. Uh, after working for 35 years, both in the US and India, I decided to go back to school about five years ago to get a degree, advanced degree in psychology. Uh, so I'm a qualified, experienced professional psychological counselor. I specialize in mental health counseling, relationship counseling, career counseling, uh, grievance counseling, and even more specifically, counseling for C-level executives and startup founders. They are a very unique cohort by themselves. Their challenges are very different from what others face. So I have quite a lot of C-level executives and startup founders in my counseling client list. You may want uh, to read your slides, huh? Sorry, say again? Your slides are still in the first one. You may want to move your... I got to the second one. You haven't seen the second one yet? 
No, not yet. Uh, how about now? No, you still the end of line. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, now you are the fourth, fifth one. Yeah, okay, good. Yes. Okay. So, social as uh, Shankaran said, I do quite a lot of social work here, almost ninety percent of the time, with various NGOs. The one NGO that um, Shankaran is talking about, it's not my NGO. I only work with an existing NGO. We provide quite a lot of services. We do um, uh, house cleaning, house cleaning services for a couple of uh, government hospitals in Chennai. We take care of the entire um, housekeeping in terms of cleaning the hallways, toilets, linen, surgical equipments, etc. All at no cost to the government or the or the hospital, with our own money, time, and our own employees. Uh, we also provide food for 500 people every single day. Uh, 500 people in the morning and about 300 people in the evening every single day at three area hospitals and one uh, girls hostel. Uh, and in addition, we also do several educational initiatives providing. Uh, student has student fees assistance to uh, high high performance uh, but uh, financially challenged people, and also work during uh, natural disasters like floods etc. to provide uh, uh, to provide uh, rehabilitation services for those affected. I'm a U.S. citizen, over citizen of India. I live in India, so I'm a tax resident of India. But I travel to the U.S. several times every year. My children are both in the U.S. My wife and I live in Chennai. I got my degree in College of Engineering, Gindi, Mechanical Engineering, then Master's from State University of New York, and then did my advanced degree in counseling, psychological counseling from Symbiosis University. I run three marathons every year. I also follow Shankaran's, uh, Shankaran's path, and I'm started to do a little bit of organic farming, although my experience is probably not even a fraction of what he has. Exactly. But it's great learning, and uh, I... Started off being a hobby, now it's become more of activism because I find the farmers are not getting the right value for their effort. And so we are trying to see what we can do about it. That's about me. Uh, in addition to this um, particular representation, I also do a lot of free webinars, uh, an introduction to entrepreneurship, angel investment basics, mentoring basics. The one that might be of interest to you guys is the next two, opportunities for investment for NRI and OCI in India. I do this every six months in terms of what opportunities are there, because a lot of people in the U.S. don't know what, are, what they're eligible for, for investing in India and what are the uh, trade-offs and pros and cons. I do that for people in the U.S. I also do a U.S.-India tax immigration foreign exchange management. This is a fairly important topic. Almost all of the Indians who live in the U.S. are non-compliant in both U.S. and India. Mm -hmm. And and this because people just don't know what the rules are. And so I did this presentation. This is actually a fairly long, it's actually a two-hour presentation detailed going details of um, India tax, US tax, immigration, foreign exchange. Happy to do that if you guys feel it's important for you at some point. Um, as a psychologist, also do mental health awareness with the real life case studies. I do it for schools, colleges, uh, offices, universities, corporate people, etc. Also in global business and entrepreneurship or retirement planning. And one thing I didn't mention here is I also have a presentation for people who at some point plan to return back to India. It's called R2I, Return to India presentation. It's not there in the list here, but that's a presentation I did recently for people who live in the U.S. who are contemplating coming back to India in their retirement time. And the question is, uh, what are the what are the factors to consider? What are the pros and cons? Who does it work for? Who doesn't it work for? Etc. It's a lot of details in that. So if you want, I can do that presentation also at some point in the future. So there's a guideline for the session. Please stay muted in the session. The entire session is recorded by Shankaran. During Q&A, please unmute and ask your question. I'll try my best to answer as many questions as possible, and uh, I'll provide a soft copy of the presentation for your information after the presentation is over. And of course, there is no fee to attend this session. So, end of life planning. What is it? Yeah. Uh, before uh, your slide just still stuck. Okay, hang on. Let me. I think it's not. Uh, it's not picking up the. Uh, yeah, you may want to switch your uh, modes between two monitors. We are seeing the the PowerPoint view. You may be seeing the presentation mode. And you may be moving the slides there, but uh, it's okay, not moving. Yeah, yeah thank good. you. Is it, is it okay now? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So before I start the end of life, I just wanted to give take a minute to say why I'm doing this. Uh, in the last, I'd say five to six years, uh, I had the uh, unfortunate experience of uh, seeing uh, a bunch of my uh, friends and relatives who passed away rather abruptly without much, uh, without, without having any, uh, any idea. And uh, that caused a lot of, problems in addition to the grief that usually goes with losing someone the uh, frustration and hassles of trying to figure out what that person was doing uh, and i went through it about 
six times in the last five years and both in the US as well as in India. And I found out that a lot of those things could have been completely avoided if that person had done something to at least uh, keep track of what they were doing so that the people who are left behind don't have to scramble. And I'll tell you that in one case, this third year, still we haven't figured out what the person is doing completely. So it's a very long process if you don't leave any record of what you're doing. So what I'm going to cover here is what all things that you could possibly be doing when you are awake and alive that could make life a whole lot easier for people who are going to be there after you leave this world. So that's why end of life planning. So it's planning what to funding for what you wish to happen when you leave this world. It's like leaving instructions on how you wish to be cared even before when you are not well and if you are sick, you want to make sure that your loved ones know what you want to do in terms of your medical care and other otherwise. And there are ways and means of putting this in a legal document, both in the US as well as in India, which I'll cover briefly. Uh, end of life planning is basically a combination of a, fo a physical folder, physical binder, or electronic spreadsheet, electronic documents, and it's all your information, decisions, preferences, and instructions. And I walk you through what kind of information that would be good to collect. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, so your trusted family members, your spouse, your children, or your friend or your relative uh, should know the exact location of where you put the document. It's one thing to do all the work of documenting and the other one is not to tell them where it is. It's as good as not existent. So make sure that when you finish this exercise, you tell someone, a trusted family member, location of this particular document or spreadsheet or the file folder so they can use it to uh, to, to recreate uh, your uh, aspects of your life when you're not there. You should do, keep duplicate copies of this document. I would, I would recommend have one printed hard copy and one stored in the computer. The reason being, you know, I often find out that the, the files that are stored in my computer, for whatever strange reason, sometimes get corrupted. So you don't want to do all the work and then find out when the person wants to use it, they're not able to use it. So keep one in the printed hard copy stored in a safe place and one copy in a pen drive or a CD. It is not a good idea to keep it online. So some people say, can I put it in the cloud? You can, but you know, I had to say that you know, maybe I'm paranoid or something, but the amount of hacks and uh, the amount of uh, hacks that and people taking into the online services is so much that I don't have a good, I, I don't feel like keeping it online because the data you're going to keep there contains very important critical personal and financial information. You don't want that to be hacked and landing in the wrong hand. So I would say better not to keep it online in a cloud, but keep it in a soft copy and a hard copy at home where people can access it when they need. Um, next slide. Why is it important? Uh, why should I do that? It's your moral responsibility. I will say it's a moral responsibility because if you really do care for your family members, you really should not make it difficult for them when you leave. So it's a moral responsibility to you, family members. It's for your family members to know everything about you, your assets, your liabilities, and other details in absence. It definitely helps mitigate the pain of your loved ones during times of grief and distress. I can tell you that you know, when someone passes away uh, rather abruptly, um, the, the shock and pain is, 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 is one thing. Trying to figure out what to do with that after the fact is even more painful. And I would definitely say this can certainly mitigate to a large extent the pain. And that to ensure that your family do not have to make any difficult decisions or guesses, if you don't say what you need to be done with whatever you have, you have people trying to make decisions on your behalf. And if you have more than one person, very likely it's going to be a dispute. So you don't want that to happen and put your, your family members in a situation where they are not working with each other. Okay. Uh, again, continuing with why is it important? Ensure your family members are not lost in knowing where they stand financially. This is very critical because in several other cases, the spouse of the person who passed away had absolutely no idea, none whatsoever, what this person was worth financially and more importantly, where the money was. So definitely please make sure. And I don't know why this is a cultural thing or maybe it's a, uh, gender, uh, gender, more of a gender thing. Women don't seem to want to know what the husbands are doing. I don't know why. My wife is very different. She wants to know everything I'm doing, but most <laughs> people don't want to know what they're doing. And because of that, women are blissfully unaware of what their spouses are doing in terms of financial uh, disposition. And it's very, very difficult for them to even know what to do when they don't know what they're worth. Also eliminate any disputes or disagreements between your family members. Because if you don't leave a proper instructions or a proper uh, notification, people are going to make assumptions on their behalf that is convenient to them. And that's going to result in a lot of problems in terms of wealth distribution and, uh, and distribution of belongings. And most importantly, even when you're alive and okay, it helps you organize and keep all your important documents in one place. I find it interesting that I have more usage for it now myself after having done that. 
but I can access all my documents when I need them and, and it's quite handy to, to get that done. So it's also valuable to you, not only people who are going to leave behind. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to quickly run through all the slides. The idea is not necessarily to talk about every slide, but I, what I want to do is I want to give anecdotal uh, stories about why certain things are more important than others. And then, of course, you can read through the slide when I give you the soft copy. Think about it in, in your head, in your own head about yourself. You are actually keeping at least 13 different types of information, which most people don't document. So I put all this information here to say, what are the 13 pieces of information that I have classified them under? that you need to document so somebody would know what you're up to. So personal information, medical, legal, tax information, savings, investments, real estate, employment, retirement, insurance, digital, very important, educational and estate planning. So we'll go through one by one. The first one is fairly straightforward, personal information. Last name, trust me, sometimes people have names different in their passport, and different in their education, different in that. For some of these documents, some of these activities that had to happen after you're gone, people need the official legal last name, which usually is what is there in the passport. So you need to make sure that you document what your legal name is so that when somebody is going to make a claim, they're not giving a name that the bank is going to reject. So write down in a piece of paper your legal name, first middle and last name, copy of your birth certificate, the landline mobile numbers, your passport numbers. In, for people in the US, a green card or a citizenship. For people who are US citizens living in India or in the US, an OCI card information. Um, and then uh, further, if you're in India or in US, voter ID, PAN card, Aadhaar card, driving license, marriage certificate, and social security card. Aadhaar card is an interesting one. I don't know if you guys know that. If you If you die in India, if somebody has to go and take you to the crematorium, the crematorium will ask for the ID of the dead person. You have to produce the other card of the person, otherwise they can't take you inside. So you better have make sure that the other card is kept somewhere that people can reach, otherwise they won't know what to do with you. So other card is very important. I don't know what is the situation in the US. I guess in the US you can show your driving license or a passport, they should be able to deal with that. But here other card is essential. Um, and then ration card, any professional associations, any employee ID card, any medical insurance card, any divorce certificate, that's very, very important. I know of cases which I had to deal with where the person was married to a lady and then he divorced and then married to a second person. Second lady did not know the first person's disposition. So when the person passed away without leaving instructions, there is a debate about if that property belonged to both of them or one of them. And without a divorce certificate, anybody can make a claim both in the US and India for all your properties. So for the benefit of the person you are married to right now, please make sure that if you had any divorce before, make sure the certificate is available so that it doesn't cost anyone else to make any unnecessary claims. And of course, in, if you're living in the US, you can also keep your state ID. I have one from Texas. I presume all states give you an ID as well. Uh, that's the personal information. Uh, in terms of contact details, uh, very important. Please make sure you drop, document the contact details, including any landline mobile number and uh, with all the country code etc all that for your spouse your children your siblings your in-laws your close friends your close colleagues your neighbors i'll tell you for four years ago one of my neighbors was 80 year old gentleman uh, he literally dropped dead literally dropped dead and i had no idea how many children he had and where they were and who they were and so his wife was with him such a shade of shock that she said i have four children please tell them and i had no idea who the four children were where they were and I asked them, how do I reach them? She said, my husband has it, who's dead right now. So I asked her, do you have anywhere I can find information? And I had to dig through a lot of their prop material to find a handwritten contact book this gentleman was maintaining. And the funny thing, when I went to the hand handwritten book, it had names of the people in his family, that, how he calls them, without telling it's a son or a daughter or anyone else. So I had to kind of call randomly through that list until I got those four children to tell them, your dad is somewhere. So it's very important. It took me almost four hours to get to know who to inform when this person is no more. So make sure that you write all the details so that the whoever is going to be taking care of you after you're gone would be able to at least reach the right people at the right time uh, to get the information so you can get everything organized and move forward. Um, personal contact details also include your uh, uh, number for your um, auditor, your chartered accountant, your tax consultant, your primary care physician, very important. 
when you're taken to an emergency room, whether in the US and India, they're going to ask you for your primary care physician's information. If I have to take someone, if I don't have the primary care physician, it could be cause some delays in admissions, et cetera. So please make sure you write down your primary care physician or family doctor's name and number, any specialist doctors you might be visiting, advocates, your manager or MD in your office, um, all that information you can document. Uh, also, in addition, you can keep document, document your uh, insurance agent and any private life insurance agents, your medical insurance agent, your auto insurance agent, any financial consultant you might be using, your estate planning consultant, your will and trust executor. Very, very important. I don't know if you know this. You can write a great will. And you can also mention who is going to be the executor and who is the trustee. But if those people are not known, the people who are left behind, the will is as good as useless. So please make sure that the wills, executor and the trustee names are clearly mentioned somewhere so that when they actually start to do the probate of the will, they know who to contact and who has to execute that. Unfortunately, in one of the cases, had the person had a great will, but he didn't tell who the executor was. So we didn't know who the executor was. And, and we had to go back and do a lot of legal formalities to create a new executor, which is a very painful process. And of course, you have to put uh, the numbers of your bank managers and relationship managers in your uh, savings bank accounts. Uh, in terms of medical information, uh, information that you want to document, prescription of all the medicines that you're currently taking with strength in milligrams, dosage, any specific instructions, list of medical devices that you're using, inhaler, blood pressure monitor, glucometer, etc. Online or pharmacy details and contact numbers. Your vaccinations record, very important, particularly post-COVID. If you're going to be taken to an emergency room, they're going to ask you, are you vaccinated for COVID? And you need to show proof of that. So make sure your vaccinations are recorded and in a place. Um, Surgery related documents. Um, if you had any surgeries in your life, so make sure you mention because doctors in the emergency room or doctors who take care of you would need to know your medical history and any surgical history. Any specific issues, you want to make sure you mention that. Um, list of drug allergies, extremely important. Extremely, extremely important. I'll tell you a very sad story. One of the uh, uh, acquaintances I had had a medical emergency and that person had to be taken to the hospital. The person had severe pneumonia. We had to take him to the hospital for attendance. And then the doctor there asked if that person has any allergies and we were not aware of any. And it so happened this person actually had a penicillin allergy. When they administered, the person died because of penicillin. So very important to make sure that if you know of any allergies, please, please document them so that when someone is going to take care of you, they will make sure that they don't administer a medicine that's going to cause problems for you. Penicillin is the most important one. Anticonvulsants and NSAIDs, there are non-steroidal anti-inflammation drugs. Some of them can have very serious allergies for some people. Uh, I believe nowadays, uh, both in the US and India, there are ways for you to go and find out uh, if you have allergies. I think they have some test doses they administer to see if you have any reaction. And if you do have allergy, those test doses can actually tell that you're allergic to that. So you can mention that and document that. Most people I know don't know what they're allergic to. So it's probably a good idea, at least for these three things, go and check to make sure that if you are allergic or not, particularly penicillin, anticonvulsants, anti -convulsant, anti and NSAIDs. Uh, make sure your blood group is mentioned in case blood needs to be uh, administered. You need to know what the blood group is, any diet restrictions, any of the mental health conditions you have. Okay. So far, okay? Yeah. Okay. Educational information, not particularly very important, but still good to have your... Uh, your college school uh, school graduation, your uh, college graduation, degree and diploma certificates, any trade licenses that you have and any patent or IPA documents you have. One of the people I was helping had and I had a patent which we didn't, have, we didn't know. Uh, fortunately, we could able to get that, we stumbled upon that accidentally and that was worth something because his inventions were all worth millions of dollars. And if we didn't have this, we didn't have a claim for the patent, then somebody would have taken it. So make sure you have any patent or IPA documents. Those are also... Um, stored somewhere safely and uh, and uh, documented. Um, real estate information, uh, you definitely want to make sure your own house, your own rental property, any agricultural land or any commercial property you have are fully documented. Uh, I, I know it's somewhat easy in the US to do closing with a third party closing company. In India, it's, a, it's really a bitch, I tell you. So you need to have sale agreements, you need to have the sale deeds, you need to have what is called land parent documents, which is what they call talapatrams or, uh, or mother documents. Patta documents. Interesting in India that the sale deed doesn't give you ownership of the property. It only tells you a transaction happened where you bought something. A patta is what actually establishes legal ownership of the property. So you need to have sale deed and patta. 
you need to have encumbrance certificates to make sure that nobody else is going to put a claim on your property and then any approvals from any regulatory authorities and in the us i guess you also need to have a hoa homeowner association documents to make sure that you have fulfilled all that so make sure you have all these copies documented other real estate and commercial property documents your real estate agent or pe or re real estate company number and name if you have paid any doc, any tax 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 to your county or city or corporation make sure you have the copies of that if someone wants to dispose of the property they need to be able to show proof that you have actually have no defaulting on that so in india particularly they'll ask for the corporation tax document clarity so make sure that you keep that so that people can use it to dispose of property if they choose to also any utility documents that you may have and any home security details it's very important home security um, people have a nice good security and have nice passwords but they don't tell anyone about that when there is an emergency and somebody is having a difficult time when you go inside of the you don't know the password then you're going to end up calling the police and the fire station and that's going to cause a lot of problems so make sure you document or keep somewhere what is the home security um, activation and deactivation codes so that people can use it uh, legal information um, your advocate's name and contact details any ongoing or prior litigation documents very very important uh, there are cases i've seen where there was ongoing litigation which no one was aware of and so there were a lot of claims that were made and in india for certain kind of litigations your property can be captured even after you're gone very strange laws they have in this country i don't think us allows that but perhaps there are some laws in us also that might be antiquated but i don't know but in india definitely you want to make sure that if you have any litigation that is completed have that closure documents if there's any ongoing litigation make sure that you're documenting them and the status of the litigation so that people can follow up on that any power of attorney you are given or you got from anyone both of them any legal health certificates very important for your family to be able to claim your property you need to have legal health certificates any arbitration details you have entered into anywhere in the world you need to have that any divorce or alimony related documents extremely important if you don't have this documentation anybody can make a claim in your absence and to find out who is right and who is not right it's very very difficult any loan agreements that you have gotten or you have signed on behalf of somebody else if you are a guarantor for someone else's loan usually it doesn't affect you when you're gone but there are certain kinds of documents that people have seen where they have where you can also attach your property post your absence so please make sure that you document any loan agreements or any loan guarantors you have done any ious or promissory notes you have given and also any other services agreement professional services non disclosure etc so that people don't accidentally provide information to the wrong person in your absence which can cause some legal troubles um tax information uh, i don't know if you guys know that the statute of limitation in the united states is 10 years uh, when they want to ask you have to be able to produce your tax documents for the last 10 years same thing in india as well for any criminal criminal related activities the tax department can go infinitely backwards for any number of years so i would say at least keep 10 years worth of tax return of course keep your pan card and social security card your income tax portal uh, both in the us and india we have digital tax filings now you may have created your own password and uh, and uh, user id for that uh, it will be good to have that documented so that the person who is going to be looking at those things after your absence will know where it is any of the forms the capital gains documents you have any uh, goods and services tax registration any property tax documents any overseas income documents for those of us who have the privilege of having two citizenships india and us we have the great pleasure of paying taxes in both the countries and you want to make sure that the overseas income is documented india particularly nowadays particularly this year is very interested in knowing the overseas properties and overseas um, financial assets of people us citizens living in india they are asking a very very detailed questions i got a note two days ago from the indian tax authorities asking for incredibly detailed information about my overseas assets in the united states so please make sure you keep that because later on when audit comes and you are not there people have to be able to justify what you claimed or what you didn't claim so that they don't have any punitive damages assigned to you because of the lack of documents any wealth or inheritance or gifts or estate documents you have and any outstanding tax notices or audit notices some of the tax notices and audit notices are enforceable after you leave as well both in the us and india so please make sure you notify you would document them so that people can handle them appropriately bank savings um, banks retirement your current and savings accounts your fixed deposits your post office savings deposits a lot of people in india senior citizens love post office savings i couldn't figure out life of me why it is very important they don't provide very much interest but it sounds like a people have a cultural or a 
or a emotional attachment to post office here. So a lot of people have post office savings. Unlike a bank, which could be somewhat reasonable, post office is just very strict to the loss. If you don't provide a certain document, they'll just refuse any service to you. So please make sure that any post office savings you have might be as documented properly. Um, Non-banking financial companies. Uh, this is a concept in India where you have companies that are loaning money, but they don't take, uh, they don't have a regular banking. So, so companies such as Sundaram Finance, Mahindra Finance, and Sriram Finance, make sure you have all the um, uh, fixed deposit information, loan information from them, and also any credit union accounts you might maintain in the US. Credit cards, debit cards, and ATM cards. Very, very important. Uh, make sure you document all the credit cards that you have in terms of which bank, and what card, MasterCard, Visa, et cetera, any recent statements, any payments you have outstanding, any maximization limit, any additional card holders, very, very important. If you had given a card to someone you know from your account, if that person continues to spend, it's your liability. So please make sure that you document so that those cards can be canceled when you are left the world. PIN numbers and security questions for accessing your credit card and any online account you have for accessing your credit card information. Same thing with debit cards and ATM cards. Uh, financial investments, um, mutual funds, equity debt, mutual funds. PMS is a concept in India. I don't know if you guys in the US are familiar. PMS is a mechanism by which you have a, a, a company in India which can do the stock trading on your behalf with your inputs. Uh, very, very, very interesting scheme. The result, the return from PMS for the last 10 years have been outstanding for me. So any of you who are in the US who would like to consider investing in India, I would highly recommend look for some PMS profile management systems. There are plenty available. Not all of them are great, but the ones that I've been using for the last few years have been really very well, uh, uh, done very well, actually. So any PMS, if you do have any PMS, make sure you document all the details, including the DMAT account numbers and DMAT account name as well. Uh, any stock brokerage accounts you may have, any crypto assets. Crypto assets are interesting because unlike the regular uh, traditional investments, crypto assets are usually maintained in a crypto wallet or an NFT wallet or in some other place. So you make sure you do document where that is so that people can access them to monetize them. If you have Bitcoin, as you know, Bitcoin is going through the roof right now. If somebody had Bitcoin bought several years ago and they are not there in the world. Uh, there are people who are left behind but be sitting in a bunch of money actually because Bitcoin is just going through the roof. It's, it's, it's expected in the new administration to even go further. So any of you owning crypto assets, I do own a bit of crypto and NFTs. NFTs are useless. They don't go anywhere, but crypto wallets and cryptocurrencies are doing very well. Uh, bank safety locker details. Of course, we have maintained any documentation in your bank safety locker. You need to make sure you put all the items in the locker that you have so that people can access them and also the location, the physical keys for those uh, lockers. Further, any tax-free government bonds, any sovereign government bonds, these are all specific to India. Indian government has released a whole bunch of tax-free bonds and sovereign bonds in the last five years. The entire infrastructure of in India is funded by public bonds, and these bonds are amazing. They are completely tax-free, and they give a yield of more than 12%. So it's better than most mutual funds and completely backed by the sovereign guarantee of the government of India. So if you have any of those bonds, please make sure you mention them. These are all 15-year bonds. They also have a secondary... Um, they can also do secondary trading on them. So if people want to... Uh, liquidate them they can do it but they need all the information and the and the account details for that if you're an angel investor like me any angel or vec and p investments you have made term sheets sha spa etc all that needs to be there because if you want to liquidate that then you need to have all the information particularly if you have physical uh, share certificates they need to be turned in for you to liquidate them in india nowadays they do everything in digital form they put it in a dmat form but nevertheless, people need to know which DMAT account you have, all this so they can do a liquidation accordingly. Any foreign bank accounts, if you're living in the US, if you have accounts in India or vice versa, you want to make sure you document all of them so people can access them. And any foreign mutual fund or stock brokerage accounts, you need to document them as well. Loans and financial liabilities, very, very important. If you do not want to leave a headache for your people who are behind, living, be left behind you, left behind by you. So loans, mortgages, and financial liabilities, please make sure you document them, any loan agreements, loan amounts, lender information, guarantor information, etc. Could be any kind of loan, loans, loans, personal loans or loans against your provident fund, loans against your FDs, home loan, property loans, automobile loans, uh, education loans, medical loans, any higher purchase agreements that you might have and lease agreements that you might have. All these things are important because the documentation is very essential for them to close all these loans and liabilities. So please make sure you 
document them as well. Uh, bills and paid subscriptions, uh, all kinds of bills that we are all paying every year, so every month, make sure you document them so you don't have any defaults. In some cases, if you are defaulting on the bill, your credit rating might get affected, and it also affects if you have joint accounts, for example, your spouse's credit rating also honestly gets affected. So make sure that you maintain all the bills that you're normally paying so that people can check and make sure there's no outstanding payments required or any defaults on them as well. And uh, also cancel any mobile apps or social media apps. These are all perpetual subscriptions. So if you don't cancel them, they'll gladly keep running on your behalf and taking money from your bank. So make sure that you uh, you document those things as well. Insurance information, um, life insurance. Interesting, life insurance is an interesting story in India. Uh, I was going through all the documentation to research, LIC, Life Insurance Corporation of India, has a lot of assets. 22% of all the assets is unclaimed insurance money. Almost a fourth of LIC's entire asset is money that people just did not claim. Unbelievable. People take fake life insurance, but don't tell anyone they have insurance or don't keep the documentary in the right place. And that money goes to the government, give to the government. I don't think your intention would be to give to the government that you are saved for your spouse after you leave. So please make sure that Life insurance information is clearly mentioned in terms of policy number, duration, amount of uh, assurance, maturity date, and, uh, and any information regarding that. In India, we have various kinds of insurances, term insurance, whole life, variable, you live. Each one has its own terms and conditions. You want to make sure the documentation is kept for all of them so they can be um, claimed appropriately. Any health insurance information you might have, uh, dental coverage, insurance coverage, uh, type of insurance, et cetera, all that. Um, home insurance, uh, people in the U.S. generally take home insurance. You want to make sure you have all that information. Automobile insurance that you have for your car or your uh, two-wheelers. Um, any long-term disability is a very U.S. phenomenon. People get long-term disability and uh, they pay for the money. And so you need to make sure that in case you become disabled or not, not able to respond, not able to take care of yourself, people need to know what kind of LTD you have uh, and uh, make sure the documentation is available for that. Home rental insurance and Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, also important because if you're in a Medicare system right now and you need to make sure that the information is available, uh, not that you can't retrieve the information, but Medicare, medical, Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid departments aren't particularly very helpful when you're asking for critical help. So it'll be better for you to keep all the information ready and uh, available. Uh, physical assets, the next parting. Make sure you have a list of all the physical assets you actually own. Your automobiles, your jewel, gold and diamond items, your precious metals, any expensive electronic items you have, any high value artwork, paintings, murals that you may have, musical instruments, books, electronic devices, computer, laptop, etc. blah, 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 all that stuff. The reason I'm putting all this is because you want to make sure that you have a clear idea of who you're going to give this to. If you don't put anything and people don't know what assets you have, then people might just claim it to their own, take it away. So you want to make sure that you make a list of all this and hopefully write in the will who it belongs to. In, when you're leaving this world. So make sure that you document all these things. I tried to put as much of information as I could remember from the experiences I had, but I'm sure there are things that I might have left out here. But if you have, if you think of anything that I haven't mentioned in my entire presentation, please do tell me. I constantly update this presentation to make it even more complete and valuable. So if you see something in the presentation that you think I haven't covered or I haven't covered adequately, I would definitely welcome any feedback from you to make it more uh, valuable to the the audience in the future. Uh, so high value artwork, instruments, etc. all that we saw. Uh, also any cameras, smartwatches, any expensive dress you might have, physical photos and photo albums. It's very important. We all do all this stuff to create photo albums and digital photos, keep it in Google Photos, etc. But if you don't tell people where they are, how to access them, it's as good as non-existent. So I know today, today's world, people have a lot of data in the cloud uh, in terms of photos and videos, etc. So please make sure that the location and the way to access them is documented. Any foreign currency you might have. I know that I keep a little bit of uh, US dollars in my in my in myself uh, when I'm here in India. So when I go to the US, I can use it. So make sure that all those is also um, documented enough that people think that. And other metal items you have: brass, bronze, copper items, etc. Uh, employment information. If you're currently employed, a company name, designation, years in service, your department, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all that. Um, and any consulting and freelance work agreements you might have, those things need to be terminated in your absence. So please make sure that those things are also called out specifically in the end of life planning folder. Uh, any provident fund account, PPF is basically like your 401k in the US. It's basically a retirement account. 
any gratuity, any, any concept in India, gratuity is something in addition to the provident fund, which is also maintained by the company that is owed to you when you retire. Stock options, stock purchase plans, RSU, very, very important. In one example of a person that I work with who passed away, that person had RSUs from his previous employer, which no one knew. We accidentally stumbled upon that. And guess what? Those RSUs are worth a million dollars. A million dollars. And we just accidentally stumbled and the spouse had no idea, none whatsoever, that this person actually had anything remotely called RSU. So please make sure if you do have stock options or SPPs or stock warrants or RSU documents or any phantom stock, please make sure you, you basically mention all of them and that way people can ensure that they get the benefit of those things without the company taking it away. Companies will not inform you. If you don't claim RSU, they won't inform you. So please make sure that you write down all this information. I know that senior hey, executives... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, what's an RSU? It's okay. a restricted, restricted stock unit. RSU is basically companies... Uh, is more popular in the US, also in India, is companies for senior executives give you what is called a restricted stock unit. It is basically free shares. Uh, they'll okay. say that Thank over you. the next four years, you invest 25% of 1,000 shares. So unlike stock options where you have to purchase, exercise the option and purchase, here it's free shares given to you. And a phantom okay. stock is where, phantom stock is not really stock uh, certificates, but a parallel uh, virtual stock uh, that they give you where you don't actually own the stock, but you get money for the stock's value. So that is very okay. common, in the, particularly in IT companies, they give phantom stock nowadays. So any RSUs, warrants, purchased uh, stock options or phantom stock, you document them. Pension plans or 401k or okay. other documents, you want to do that. And then any employer medical insurance coverage details that you have currently if you're employed. Um, employment information, um, uh, any other uh, leave travel allowance, any leave details, because a lot of the leave travel allowance and leave details in India are reimbursable. If you haven't used them, that could be worth a good amount of money. Any expense accounts and company credit cards. This is very important. Companies usually don't know what, don't keep a full time of what company employees have credit cards. If you had a company credit card and if you, the company doesn't, didn't know that, that, you know, they're going to cancel that, then any, any charges made in the card is liability for both you and the company. So you don't want to have that situation. So make sure that if you have any company cards, document them and let your people tell the company to take it away when you're gone. Uh, payroll and direct deposit bank details, any recent pay slips, any employer provided tax documents, long-term incentive plans, very specific to the US. Uh, LTIP is what some companies offer to their uh, senior employees. This is basically a tax deferred plan, uh, wherein the, the money is actually put in LTIP, which you can only redeem after a certain period of time. Those things have to be claimed. So please make sure you document any LTIPs that you might have from the company, any deferred tax and taxation compensation, any variable compensation plan as well. Uh, if you're a business owner or entrepreneur, then you want to make sure that you document all the partnership agreements, LLP, LLC, uh, article association, any memorandum of understanding, all kinds of uh, regulatory documents, stand number, MCA, etc. All that needs to be uh, maintained so that uh, in the, your absence, then your partner or your uh, director of the company can make sure that they take care of all the necessary regulatory uh, work in your absence. Uh, digital information. I want to spend a time on that. You know, I was doing doing analysis for myself to see how many passwords that I have in my head. My count was three hundred and thirty eight. I have three hundred and thirty eight different user IDs and passwords of various services in my head. So imagine if you leave the world and you know, no one knows what those passwords are. All the information you have and all this digital uh, digital um, mediums and devices will be virtually useless. So please make sure every password you have is documented in a very safe place. Specifically and most importantly, your phone, phone lock password, your home computer password and your laptop password. Almost all of us keep a lot of our information on one of the three devices. And if you don't provide the password to open those devices, particularly if you have an Apple or a Mac device, it's virtually impossible to get to that information because Apple will ask you the ungodly amount of information to open that. One of my friends had an Apple uh, tablet, uh, iPad, and, and it took us a lot of time and a lot of requests to Apple to be able to get to open that particular device. Because otherwise, Apple does so much of security encryption, it's impossible to get access to the information. So please make sure that you document your mobile phone uh, passwords and your home computer passwords 
somewhere that people can actually use it and, and uh, access the information. All your work and personal emails, your social media accounts. Social media accounts are important. If you just keep these accounts, a lot of people who actually take your name and start posting on your behalf, this happens very regularly, particularly in Instagram and Facebook, notorious for people taking your identity there. So please make sure if your social media accounts document them so the people who are left behind can actually close those accounts or do something with those accounts. Any net banking, online banking information, even passwords you might have, your credit card pins, your debit card pins, your ATM card pins, your mutual fund, PMS, DMAT account, online access, user ID and passwords, your crypto wallets and crypto exchange account, you know, user ID and passwords. In your digital wallets, uh, this is a very particular U India function. You have what is called UPI, Unified Payment Interface, an extremely, uh, extremely convenient way of making any payments without cash in India. Almost every single human being in India has UPI access. Now you can pay anyone anywhere in India with a digital payment option through UPI. So you want to make sure that if you have any digital wallets or UPI accounts, you document them so people will know what to do with them. Any cloud storage accounts, Google Drive, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, etc. You may put a lot of data there, but people need to be able to get to that to access that. So make sure you document what accounts you have and what passwords you set for that. Any online photo storage, any online purchase apps, any mobile phone app accounts. If you have subscribed for a bunch of app accounts, then those things will keep getting charged unless someone goes and cancels the subscription. Uh, next topic, retirement accounts. Um, definitely you want to make sure that this information is documented because a lot of our money is probably kept here, expecting a first use during retirement. So provident fund details, who are the beneficiaries, particularly if you don't, if you haven't mentioned beneficiaries, please take the time to go and document beneficiaries or nominees for all your retirement accounts. Any gratuity information, any annuities, if you have subscribed any annuities, you want to make sure that people know about them because some of the annuities can actually pay some money, lump sum at the end. Most annuities will stop after you are not in the world, but some annuities have cl cl clauses where you can get some lump sum money at the end. So make sure that you document them so people can get those money. Any IRAs that you might have, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, education IRA, I know Roth IRA is a very famous thing for a lot of high net worth individuals. Please make sure you document all those traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. And if you are a self-employed person, you might have a 403B or a Kiyok account. You want to make sure you document that as well. And of course, a lot of us now have a social security information, a social security portal. So you want to make sure that someone has access to the portal so that they can get all the information, particularly if your spouse is uh, spouse is getting some benefits out of social security and both the information maintained in the social security portal, your spouse needs to be able to access that for them to make any particular claims or any changes to the thing. So please make sure you document the social security portal, user ID and password, uh, and any online information that you might have. Estate planning information. Estate planning is basically a will and trust planning. So last will and testament, how, when, who, and what of the property and assets distribution. Interesting, um, there is a will that you can create a will in the US, you create a will in India. Technically, a will in one country should be enforceable in another country as well. But between US and India, I have seen cases where judges in India sometimes don't understand or don't want to understand the will in the US and they end up causing a lot of delays. So my recommendation is, is to have a separate will, one will covering all your assets in the US, written in the US, and one will written for all assets in India, written in India and registered in India. It's a better way to do it. that way you can claim them independently. There is no need for you to combine both of them. You can keep them separate. So you can make sure you can execute them. Um, any advanced healthcare director, this is a very unique US phenomenon. You want to make sure that you document what kind of medical treatment and end of life care you want to have. In the absence of that, your doctor and your spouse has to make this decision. And it's a very difficult decision for them to make in your absence when you're not uh, conscious. So please make sure you put all your advanced healthcare directive. This is actually a formal legal document, which you need to do. What I did in the US, I, I used online tools. Norton, Norton has an online tool that helps us build wills and trust. It's called NOLO, N-O-L-O. -O. So I used NOLO software, which is a software that costs about $150 or something. That actually walks you through and make sure you can write a proper legal will. And I know if you know in the US, each state has its own regulations on how they administer wills. So please make sure if you have assets in different states in the US, you need to make sure you make sure they will complies with all the state regulations also. In India, we don't have that problem. We have only one will you can enforce throughout the, throughout the country. But in the US, we have state regulations that could have different regulations compared to another state. So make sure that your last will and testament and your advanced healthcare directives 
or written such a way that it covers all the regulations in all the states. And Norton makes a, does a very good job of actually capturing all the information and then creating the will for you, which you can go and take it to a notarized person and get it notarized. That way it becomes official and legal. And then you can give that will copy and the, own, and the original in one place and let someone in your family know where it is. Most important, right? So last will and testament, advanced healthcare directives, any living trust, uh, there's a difference between creating a will and a trust. There are some pros and cons of doing will versus trust. I won't go into that detail right now. I have a separate presentation specifically only for that. But for the purposes of this discussion, understand that you could have a will and you could also have a trust. If you have both or one, make sure you document the information in that, particularly for who's access to that and who's at, uh, who's the executor and who's the trustee in this one. Um, designation of guardian. For people who have young children or who are living parents, you want to make sure that you mention who is supposed to take care of them when you leave this world. It's a very big problem if you have young minor children and you leave them here and uh, who is going to take, uh, take care of them becomes a big deal, big problem. So make sure you specify who is going to take care of your children in absence, the living parents, even pets and pet care as well. And some of us are very close to our pets, so we want to make sure that you put specific information who is going to take care of your pets when you leave this world. And similarly, any power of attorney you assign, a financial PO and a medical PO, those two are different documents. A financial PO only takes care of all your financial activities. A medical PO only takes care of medical activities. They cannot be combined. They're two separate documents that has to be maintained. And they have very different information and very different people who are responsible for them. So please make sure you document your financial power of attorney and your medical power of attorney. All these things, the estate planning topic I'm talking about here is mostly US related. But there is also corresponding documents in India, but not quite as clean and clear as it is in the US. And NOLO, the Norton software, can do all these things for you. All of the boy told you can, can be done very easily by yourself. Go to yourself model. If you still uh, need yeah. some. Sorry. Uh, no, one question. Just, uh, can you elaborate on this uh, financial and medical uh, thing for our attorney? Yeah, the financial power of attorney is for anyone you nominate as your person to do any financial transactions on your behalf when you're still alive but not able to perform or after your death as well. So somebody has okay. to go ahead and say, so for example, you need to take money from your savings account or from your liquidity investment to pay for your medical care, then somebody has to be given the financial POA for them to actually do the transaction on your behalf to be able to take the money. Medical POA is for someone to make decisions about if they want to do any, uh, if you have any DNRs, do not resuscitate things in your, in your uh, oh, okay. the thing. So, you, so medical POA, someone has to make medical decisions on your behalf. So financial decisions could be different medical decisions and different people you may have designated for different decisions. So you want to make sure you have both a financial POA as well as a medical POA. Is this called the living will? That the yes, living, will? living, living. Yeah, some in some places they call it the living deed or okay, something like that. You. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, finally, organ donations, obituary and funeral arrangements may not be a very big deal for you, but organ donation, I'm very big into organ donation. I want to make sure that my organs, the good organs are uh, given to someone to, to, to give a life to them. So you, if you're interested in doing that, you can do a eye, liver, kidney, all kinds of do donations. But in India and also in the US, you need to have written that. Otherwise, somebody else cannot make a decision. Now in India, they violate the rule. For example, when my mom and dad passed away, they didn't have any will. I told them my the attend Lions Club won't take it. The Lions Club came and took it without asking me anything, which is against the law. They need to have someone saying it's okay, remove them. I think in the US it's a lot more strict because you can't just donate somebody else's body parts. Um, so I think you need to write this down. And there are there are ways you can do this inside a legal way as well, so that people know exactly what they can take from you. And uh, also, if you want to plan a specific type of funeral for yourself that you have in mind, you have to put it down in a legal document so people can follow that. And some people also write their own obituary. Believe me, some people want to do that as well. Uh, if you have an interest in doing that, you can write it down so that people can actually publish it. I think that's all I had. I uh, hope you found this information useful. I know I ran through the thing very, very fast. I'll provide a copy of this presentation for you to review in detail. But what I would like to do is to take any questions from you guys. And the last slide gives me all my contact details which will also be in the presentation. You're welcome to contact me if you have any specific questions. As much as possible, with my knowledge and understanding, I'll try to answer you. If I don't have an answer, at least I can point you to who might be able to give you the answer. Because I do work with a lot of providers on behalf of my friends and family who are in the situation to tell them who to contact for what kind of questions. 
So I'll be happy to you know, provide contacts and referrals to you. So please feel free to contact me in any of these channels. Uh, WhatsApp is probably the most uh, widely used. Uh, I, I tend to look up my WhatsApp far more regularly than any other about. So that might be the easiest way to get to get, get to the attention. That's all I had. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'll take any questions from you, please. Thank you, Vish. Uh, you exactly finished in one example. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions. Uh, if you don't mind, Vish, uh, if you can uh, send this uh, PowerPoint to me, yeah, for the PDF or whatever, I will yeah. place it in the various groups that I uh, absolutely, and absolutely. The recording, uh, uh, I will put it on my YouTube, or if you want. Uh, uh, Vish, I send it to you. You can put it on your YouTube and get the link there. So. Sure, no problem, no problem. Okay. I can do that. I have a YouTube channel. I can put it in the YouTube channel and give it a give it a link to people to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because um, I've done this presentation probably about a couple of dozen times for various different audiences, both in the US and India. The one audience I found particularly interesting who wanted to listen is a group called Feng, Financial Executive Networking Group. Mm -hmm. This is CFOs of all the countries all over the world. And I found it very amusing. They wanted to hear it from me, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but believe me, they had lots of questions. And that was the most, uh, what I say, most interactive session I had. And they were like, you know, pinging me so many questions about how this works, how that works. And I was surprised that a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, related to finance. And those people are blissfully unaware of that. So, so a bit of shocking and surprising. But otherwise, yeah, otherwise, uh, most of the groups I presented have a lot of questions. What I also have done, is created a small Excel spreadsheet template. If you want to do it for yourself, I can I put that in Excel spreadsheet so you can start. It doesn't have very much structure. I just put all these things in a way that you don't forget to capture information I went through in this presentation. So you can use that spreadsheet. Uh, for the first purposes of uh, complete uh, transparency, I haven't done my end of credit planning completely yet. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still doing it because every time I think I'm done, I'm not done. I have more things I have to capture. It's, it, is a, it is a fairly... Uh, important uh, exercise and it will take some time to do it but i think the value is absolutely phenomenally very very high not for you in particular but definitely for people who you are you care for much so i would highly highly recommend uh, because a lot of people listen to the presentation get very uh, uh, excited on the value but don't do anything so that would be a disservice to this whole presentation so please uh, as much as possible uh, uh, do it and, and make sure that you at least do a bit of it or all of it if possible uh, to, to get the value for your members. Okay, I have some I see some questions in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, sir, uh, for spending your time with us on this topic. If I may, you know, just to the point that you mentioned about your own, uh, uh, own uh, process, I yeah. think this is a living and breathing document, right? So yeah. it, it is like until you take your last breath, it should be, you know, kept up to date. Exactly. Uh, every so often, I think is is the sense I get out of uh, out of your presentation. You know, yeah, yeah. So definitely, it will help if you you know share that spreadsheet also with uh, everyone. Yes, will do. Uh, so that you know, at least we can use that as a checklist. Exactly. I see yeah. someone writing that nice tool to store all passwords is keeppass dot info. Yeah. There's a keeppass and a last pass also. I, I used to use last pass. Uh -huh. I think keeppass I haven't used. No, I use um, keeppass a lot. It's it's very good. Uh, I don't know how secure these things are, to be honest, but uh, but it's a local capture, right? Not a not a cloud capture. It's a local capture of your password, right? Local capture, if you want, you can take it to the cloud in a particular way. But yes, it is a local capture. Okay, I used to uh, use I, last I pass. I write my passwords on a notebook on keep one notebook. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a, there is a there is an, of passwords. Yeah. I don't know. There is an application in Google called Google Keep, and Google Keep has some security features as well. So you may want to consider looking at Google Keep. Yeah, it's okay. uh, the good thing Google Keep is that you can access from any device. You can put the information in your computer. You can access in your phone, for example. So Google does a good job of Google Keep. Uh, so you can also do copies of your documents that in the Google Keep, so you can access them as well. I use it quite extensively. Uh, yeah, other question: uh, If you forget your own password for the phone, you should be better write it down. <laughs> I know. I tell you. I tell you that that's the biggest thing, right? In one of the cases, I told you, right? This person was actually a CIO of a company, and uh, we know that he is a technology technically uh, savvy guy, and he had everything in his computer, but we didn't know what the password was. And at least in a computer, it's not very difficult to find your to, to break into your password. It's not that difficult. I'll tell you. We're talking about security, computer security, right? People say Apple has the best security in the world. 
let me tell you something very interesting. Recently, about three years ago, I lost my phone. I lost my Android phone. And in India, if you lose a phone, I don't know if it's true in the US, you're supposed to go and formally make a complaint. Because if someone were to have access to your phone, either it is stolen or sold, and if they do anything that is criminal or illegal, you are still liable because you are the one who had the IMA number in your name. So if you want to avoid the liability, you need to go and report formally in the police and get a report that you have formally complained that your phone is lost. So, so when I went to... Same, the, I, same with the vehicle also. If you lose a car or a two-wheeler, yeah. if you don't complain, if then they use it for criminal activities, you are liable. Yeah. You are liable, exactly. So in this case, when I went to the police station to register my Android uh, thing, and I also asked them, is there any way you can actually retrieve the phone? And they said, why do you why do you worry? I said, I have data in the phone. And not that my data is going to be very important. I have all these things captured through passwords and and uh, and other forms of secondary uh, secondary this thing, um, all that, all the stuff. But when I asked them, I said, uh, they said, okay, you know, let me tell you, the guy said that you can find your phone and get all the information from your phone. I said, if it's an Apple phone, I guess I'm a little bit more safe. He said, absolutely not. He said, there are people in India who can crack any phone. Hmm. And he, act he actually showed me, <laughs> I'm not kidding. He actually showed me how he cracked an Apple 13. I was shocked to see him actually doing it in front of my eyes. He could mm -hmm. see every information in the phone, every one of them. So Apple can go and tell whatever the hell they want to say. It's complete bullshit. There are people in India who can crack an Apple phone and show you every piece of information in that. So it is scary. It is very scary. All the information you keep in the phone needs to be protected. So make sure if you do, unfortunately, lose your phone, make a complaint so that the phone cannot be used by anybody else. In terms of data capture, um, try and try not to keep too much sensitive information on the phone because you know if someone were to hack the phone, then it could be difficult. But uh, at least know what you're given access to what in the phone, so you can go and shut them down. When I lost my phone, it took me a day to go and shut down access to all the different things I had access in the phone. Fortunately, I had written down what all I gave access to, so I could quickly go and shut them down one by one. If I don't know what they have access to, I'll be thinking what I had access to. That's also another benefit of having this information documented, even when you're alive, that you can actually use it for mm. your own purposes mm. uh, to avoid this kind of problems. Yeah, I wish one question here, Mutu here. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like a lot of work, right? I mean, so much. Yeah. Uh, can you, do you have any priority assessments? I mean, how do we start with what? Um, I, th I think all information is useful. I said some information might be less useful, like education information may not be as important as your identity information and your and your digital information probably is the most important, I would think. Uh, I know there's no real priority. All I, all I can tell you is that I done almost 80% of the work and it took me probably about a half a dozen sittings of a few hours each to actually go back and retrieve all the information. Because what I was doing is not only documenting, but also making sure I know where it physically kept. So I had to go and search through my house all through my computer to see where I had the information, retrieve that and put it in one place so that I have complete track of where it is, etc. So it took a while to search for things. I know it's there somewhere in the house or somewhere in one of the computers, but to find exactly where it is took me a while and then capture them and put them in one place. That to that. So it, it is a time consuming process, no doubt about that. But if you spend, I think if you spend a good 10 to 15 hours of dedicated time or a period of maybe a couple of months, you can capture majority of that. I don't think it's difficult to do that. Uh, but I think the time is very well spent. And I would say try to do it sooner than later. Uh, none of us have the, uh, the assurance that our lives will be intact any time. So I would rather do it sooner than later to avoid uh, creating any unavoidable problems. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Yes, yes please. Go ahead. Whenever you make changes, it has to be notarized or how it works? In uh, in a will, you don't need to notarize. Will the way will works is that you actually have the uh oh, I think uh, wish you froze. Can you can any of you hear him? I can't hear him. Madhu, can you hear him? Uh, that's the only thing he's doing there. I think this Nolo software, Nolo is not the only one. Nolo is the one I used. Uh, there are several other software available. When I went and spoke to the estate planning managers in the US, 
they asked me so many questions, I just got, gave up on them actually. Uh, because they are very careful and want to make sure that they cover every possible aspect of your life, which in my case, my life wasn't nearly that complex as they made it look like. So I decided to do it online. And Nolo was a very good software. It was able to cover 99% of all I needed. But if you do have something very complex in your uh, financial or your uh, asset portfolio, you may want to consult a uh, uh, estate planner in the uh, How do you spell that, Nolo? N-O-L-O. It's not an online something, something. Just type Nolo and you'll, Nolo will create a, something like that. It'll tell you on Google. N-O-L-O. And uh, it, it uh, covers India also, and not only. No, it doesn't, it doesn't cover India. Nolo is only for the oh. US. It's only for oh. the US. In India, you can do it through some lawyer. There's, I don't know if any, there is a one called Vakil, uh, Vakil something in India that might have a will thing. Uh, I think Vakil search or Vakil something is there. But any any lawyer, any advocate in India can create a will for you. Will in India is somewhat simpler than the will in the US. Because there is no statewide regulations for will. So it's fairly straightforward. And uh, my um, my advocate who I use here, uh, she did the will for me and uh, it is quite straightforward. It's not a problem. So I have... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is Anand. I'm in Dubai. Thank you very ah. much for the presentation. Yeah, I have a question. My mother recently passed away hmm. and uh, we had to run around creating a family uh, relationship certificate. Legal you know, certificate. It takes a long time to go through the court and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, applying that to my case... Uh, uh, is it isn't it better that I create a family certificate list for now itself for me and my children and my wife? All you in can one? you can create a legal health certificate anytime you need a legal health certificate. Legal health certificate usually the way it works is that you are getting a certificate for yourself claiming yourself to be the legal heir of someone, right? Uh, I don't know if you can create a legal say my son is my legal heir. I I don't know exactly how, how that process works. I think the what person not? who wants a certificate has to make the claim. To get the certificate uh this might be something that audit uh, advocate can help you i'm not very sure something to declare these are all my relatives or my so this thing how do i uh, that is there in the will uh, that can be stated. no no will will only says the name of the person not necessarily how they're related to you you can put will for anyone actually it doesn't have to be a relative you can say mr x mr mr y will get this and mr x will get that miss k will get that Normally, in the US and India, I think the default is a spouse. The default goes to the spouse. And if your spouse is also not there, the default is to all your children that you claim as children. Now, in India, it's very straightforward. Children are children. In the US, you have all kinds of children. So I don't know how it works in the US. So if you have a half child or a half person and all that. So it, it is important to specifically call out by name. And I think if I remember right, it also asks the social security number of the person who I'm going to bequeath my property to so that they can clearly identify who the person is and put that. Now, for you to be able to specify who your legal heirs are, I am sure there is a process for that. I actually haven't um, checked yep. into that one, but your question is good because that, your brother. Uh, that uh, might be possible, I think. Yeah. We on the safe side, I wrote uh, my spouse's name and they mentioned the relationship. I wrote my children's name and I mentioned the relationship. And they're con all that have to be on the safe side because in Dubai, if you don't write a will and you pass, then uh, the, the, you no, know, the Sharia law applies. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know about Sharia law very well. I used to run business in Dubai, and uh, it's not very mm -hmm. funny. It's it's quite complicated. It's very different. Let me put it. It's very very different from usual very laws. Different. So different. yeah, interesting. You're in Dubai. So you the, all the people are in the call, call now are in not all in the US. I thought all of them were in the US, not all in the US, obviously. Some of them are in the UAE, some in India. Most of them are in this group are now in the US. And and, and what ties all of you together, if I may ask? <laughs> Dr. Shankaran, he's the extreme puller. <laughs> Think puller, the ghost man. <laughs> because, because if you, I, I, I understood that you guys do something together. You do investments together or you do other things together? Yeah, we all discuss investment together. We don't do investment together, but we discuss investment together. Ah, so you're just a social group to talk about where to put money and where to take money. <laughs> I, I maintain a similar group for my alumni in the US. We have about 400 people in the group as well, because a lot of them ask me about investments in India, but I also have investments in the US since I lived there for a while. And a lot of these younger people who have gone to the U.S. in the last 10 years uh, want to know how to do stuff in the U.S. in terms of investment. So I do a lot of 
complementary discussions on investment possibilities in the US and India. So I would, if possible, I want to join your group because I want to know what kind of information you are, uh, you yeah, guys are I'll sharing. I'll, I'll give your number, a WhatsApp number to the admin person there to add. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys talk about uh, other things also, not just regular investment, crypto and alternate investment funds, PE, yeah. etc., all that? You know, it's a very interesting group. Nobody fights. First of all, this is one group where nobody fights with anybody. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a very, very, it's a very interesting group. Nobody fights with anybody. And I can say this because I'm in the group and I'm I'm wondering who much should I fight with. Okay, I don't I get to quarrel with anybody. <laughs> no, but, but I, I, I bet you have people sharing different perspectives. Or for yeah. example, I tell you recently, recently, as of yesterday, in our group in the US, uh, SpaceX has come up with a uh, with a tender offer. I don't know if you know that SpaceX tender. So people are asking you, should you subscribe to that? So I had certain points of view on what does it mean to invest in a secondary offering like a SpaceX, right? There are some clear pros and there are clear cons and a very clear complications doing that also. So I write things about that saying that, okay, if you want guys to do that, this is what you should be aware of and these are things you should be thinking about. Yeah. But not everybody agrees with that. So some people might write something saying that I don't agree with your particular pro or a con. So we have discussions, not yeah. fights, but debates for sure. Uh, so that if that is welcome then that will be very useful i would think right yeah, no, anyway, in this uh, in this group we are we don't fight because we are all scared of sankaran so. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> is it is it is it mainly for stocks or uh... yeah we, we primarily it's uh, called the stock trading ideas so you know people post uh, crypto information people post uh, stock information and, uh, uh, you know, it's not just tips uh, we explain. We put our trades. We tra Oh, wow. Okay. Share your trades too. Interesting. Yeah, okay. We share our trades. Okay. So it's a very nice group. I'll, I'll give you a number to, uh, I think, oh, wow. interesting. Interesting. Is the first time I'll ask him to include you. Okay. Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so definitely you, you should uh, you should be welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely want to be part of it because I may not, I don't know if I can contribute much. I may be able to contribute because I do this with other groups regularly. Uh, hey, Manikam, and, uh, Manikam, hi, uh, good to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, uh, thank you very much. It's a very useful, uh, you know, a compilation of a useful information. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Sankaran, yes. for taking the initiative to arrange this uh, nice uh, presentation. I thank you very much, uh, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Viswanathan. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I kind of uh, I want to I want the slide uh, showing his number one more time because yeah. I want to uh, uh, you know uh, take note of the number. Oh, okay, hold on, a hold on, hold on. I'll I think you will share the presentation anyway, right? I oh. can give that to you now. Okay, hold on. You'll be able to get that. Hey, are you able to see the slide? Not yet. So you need to there. Did I? I think I shared it, right? I didn't share. Okay, I didn't share. So, okay, I had to share. Okay, I did the share button. Of course, of course. Are you able to see it now? Yeah, we see the last one. Uh, no, switch. No, no, it's gone to the last. Ah, uh, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You can use my US WhatsApp number or the India WhatsApp number. I look at both of them. Uh, because quite a lot of quite a lot of people will contact me in the US as well as in India. So, and if you guys are interested, if you're interested in the tax immigration tax and FEMA presentation, we can probably schedule some type. But that's a lot more detailed document. I'll tell you, compliance wise, most people are not compliant. So that presentation might actually be more useful for you to know what you're not compliant with. <laughs> um, because for those of us who have the privilege of living in two different countries and worked in two different countries, I, uh, I can tell you, everyone living in India is not compliant with something or the other. They will all be. You know, that's I how we the mess. So it's it's See, made for you to be non-compliant. <laughs> yeah, but the, the problem is, Indian government are now more interested in looking at people who are living outside or living outside and living the different fast food here. And yeah. similarly, U.S. government. I don't know if you know this news. Last year, U.S. government hired close to a thousand agents specifically to go after U.S. citizens living abroad. Huh? Living abroad, a thousand agents they hired last year. Hmm. Why, because why they you... because they are saying that people are not reporting or paying paying taxes on their returns and income from outside the United States. There are very clear regulations and rules saying what you have to report and what you have to pay tax on. 
and lot of people i'll tell you a simple example nre accounts lot of oh, lot of nris have nre account nre account interest is not taxable in india but it's very taxable in the us and some people assume because it's not taxable in india it's also not taxable in the us that's a wrong assumption you have to pay tax on nre income in the us right so that's one example that's one simple example there are a lot of other examples you if you're owning mutual funds in india there's a lot of regulatory reporting regulatory compliance to follow very detailed there is a specific income tax uh, irs form called 8621 8621 has to be written for every single mutual fund you have in india with great amount of detail every single year mm. similarly yeah. there is thing called fatca foreign foreign account uh, something something that you have to report every single overseas financial asset you have including things where you have financial authority over so for example i am the president of our of our uh, uh, association or our, uh, our society i have i have financial selling authority i have to report that too to the us government so all these are regulations or mandatory regulations not optional uh, compliance requirement so that presentation when i made almost everyone in the call said i am not compliant with one of the above Mm-hmm. and this might be a good way to because a lot of this compliance correction can be done fairly quickly and at least you can make sure you're not comp- not comp- non compliant anymore and you can also go back and retroactively make some things that are non compliant compliant and this also applies to india as well so one good example i'll tell you people who lived in india who went back went to the us don't close their savings accounts you are not allowed to have a resident savings account in a bank in india when you are not living in india and i know everyone who's in the us for been in india have an account open in india mm-hmm. if fema if fema gets wind of that they can seriously penalize you for that so oh. this is simple thing because fema the foreign exchange management authority is the one which manages those things they are the taxing people they are the ones who look at compliance for financial transactions and rbi is another arm which looks at what they call lrs which is lrs is basically uh, uh, sending money from india to the us um, so that also uh, rbi notices that so you need to make sure that you are compliant with the ir the rbi rules for lrs as well so three different organizations rbi fema and tax are all looking at various aspects of your financial information and all three have their own compliance requirements and they are not the same a simple definition of a non resident is not the same for taxes versus fema fema has a different definition of non resident and tax has a different definition of non resident Wow, so complex. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one yeah. quick question. Yeah. Uh, just aside from your presentation, which was so great, uh, what's your advice on crypto? Should I get out or? Uh, I think crypto, given the latest uh, election results from the United States, I think crypto is going to rock, in my opinion, because, you know, the, the very fact that Elon Musk is uh, closest to buddy of Trump lately, I think he's going to make sure that crypto gets the necessary thing. But I thought uh, Elon uh, uh, advised against crypto some time back, right? Some time back, yeah. But he also has his own crypto, this thing, a dodge coin, yes. But I think oh. I think that the, the bottom line is I think a lot of the world, most of the world is going towards digital currency, CBDC, etc. Is happening. What might become very popular is blockchain might get a second lease on life now. Blockchain didn't have much life, so blockchain and come back and make a making now. And I think cryptocurrencies. nfts i was betting big on nfts 3 years ago it became a popper because nothing happened with nfts but mm-hmm. i'm sure there are other types of financial derivative instruments in crypto space that might come up in the next few years so if you are holding on to bitcoin hang on to them dearly they will go up there's very very high chance it will grow up we'll go up to the next levels i think today it's steady at 90000 i think or something like yeah, that yeah it's 90 i just saw after you told me i just saw it. Yeah, I I I bought it for twenty nine thousand or something like that when I bought it. It's still listing listing in my Coinbase wallet, which I haven't touched in a while. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't buy enough at that time. <laughs> Looking back, but uh, yeah, I mean, I said a lot of different assets to look at. I think crypto would do well. I think um, low, small, and medium um, companies will do well in the U.S. because of the uh, because of all the things that Trump is talking about. So I don't know large cap or the blue chip companies will do particularly any difference. but uh, small and medium cap can do quite well in the next few years at least for the next two years before the midterm elections come thank you uh, yeah. and oil and gas companies of course will probably do very well as well uh, raja you are uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, firstly, Mr. Vish, thank you so much for sharing uh, all this info. It was great. I was really uh, raising my hand, and and I think you touched a bit upon that with regards to taxes and all that. You know, mm-hmm. you know when I tried to file taxes over here, you know, as you mentioned clearly, you know, not very compliant on a lot of these, you know, Indian assets and Indian uh, investments, mm-hmm. etc. And I've tried to reach out to a couple of tax providers here, but nobody wants to even touch it because it is so <laughs> complicated that they are like. We don't even want to deal with this, you know. So I'm like, <laughs> I need to be compliant, but I want somebody to help me file this stuff, right? But nobody was wishing to touch even. So yeah, um, it is interesting. And and he was one of the guy was saying that you know it is made intentionally so that um, folks over here do not you know take their money outside the country. Yeah. And so yeah. I think I think uh, the idea idea was the US uh, until until about five six years uh, until about ten years ago, US didn't even know what the citizens are doing outside the country. And there's a lot of people who are funneling money out of the U.S. and keeping it in overseas, not even tax havens, regular countries like India, and made tons of money and not report to the U.S. So I think 2000, 2010 is when India and the U.S. signed a treaty where they agreed mutually to exchange information about respective citizens. And since then, it's become a big deal. Now, the problem with the tax advisors, I'll tell you, I have one tax advisor in India who does my U.S. taxes and a different one who does the India taxes. The problem is the one doing India taxes doesn't understand everything in the U.S. taxes and vice versa. The girl who does the U.S. taxes actually lives in India, but she's a CPA from the U.S. And she's incredibly detailed. The only challenge is that she's not taking new clients. She is working with 500 clients. And she oh, says, wow. I, I don't have enough time. But the, the actual number of you know qualified, experienced, reliable people is very, very small. So I used okay. to work with another company in Chennai and they did a good job, but then they made certain mistakes. And I'll tell you, this is a very depressing statistic. Every tax advisor has made a mistake. And I, I don't know if I'm just looking at mistakes only. I caught mistakes in every one of them. And sometimes they make some horrible mistakes, actually. So I am a little bit paranoid about this. So I actually go through and check every calculation that they made again to the point now that I feel I can do it myself. I don't need them anymore. I can do it myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. and it is it is quite detailed because the u.s tax codes irs there's lots of amendments that you don't know about right unless you are plugged mm-hmm. into that uh, ecosystem you don't even know what they change because the codes change very regularly particularly this very specific niche code that people don't generally look at change even regularly i had hnr blog doing it for me when i first came from india to the u.s to india our company put me as an expert so they had kpmg assigned to me as an expert tax consultant they did a terrible job. They did a terrible job. And I was not compliant across the board. I had to go back and retroactively go and become compliant for US taxes thanks to KPMG screw up. Then I thought I'll go to HR block. It's like going from frying pan to fire. Equally bad. HR block does a great job for domestic US taxation. They know nothing about international taxes, particularly in India. So that is why these big companies are not the companies you want to go after. And if you look at the online software like TurboTax, it doesn't provide all the documents you need. 8621 is not available in TurboTax. It's a critical mm-hmm. document required. They say TurboTax for international flyers, and they do not have 8621. I don't understand that, right? Mm-hmm. So you do need to find someone. I can give you some example reference people I had worked with. All of them are okay. I, I wouldn't necessarily say all of them are bad. All of them are okay, but you need to really spend time to make sure that they're not doing anything wrong. So there is one company called Ventura Pranas in Chennai. They do a fairly good job. They also have an office in LA. So they actually have employees in LA and employees in Chennai, and they both do both taxes, US and India. Uh, so they might be, they're, they're a large company with lots of employees, and they have a fairly, uh, you know, organized structure of websites, et cetera, all that. So you may want to look into Ventura Pranas. It's V-E-N-T-U-R-A Pranas, P-R-A-N-A-S. Uh, they're quite good. They're quite good. It might be good to share that information, sir, uh, with, the, with the group here, because I'm sure everybody, you know, has the same questions here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Put the name uh, of the company here so you can uh, go and Google them. Ventura Pranas. But but to me the larger question is: Does it even make sense to invest in India? I I, I mean from a growth factor, obviously it is right. But this taxation process becoming so complex and difficult, and I, I don't know. Is there? Do you what? No, I think that uh, the way the way I look at it is that no, I made a strategic choice to come and live here. So obviously I wanted to invest here. Uh, what I would say is the following: In my last. Uh, 18 years of investments in both countries. The return I'm able to get after adjusting for inflation and currency depreciation is much better from India than the US. Much better. right? Maybe because the last 10-15 years have been much better in India in terms of stock market appreciation. From 2008 
2014 2014 10 years have been a really good time for stock appreciation but nevertheless i think the the number of things that you can do here because india is still hungry for foreign investments so they give you a lot of good provisions for foreign investors to put in things that local residents don't get so you get a much higher return of course you have to always worry about the currency depreciation and what i read in the report yesterday is in the new trump administration the currency is expected to depreciate 10% over the next 2 years so you need to factor those in as well in your calculation but i would say that the number of growth vehicles that are available in india now is higher than the us i think us has reached a point now that any additional growth is going to take a bit more effort now trump's policies may support that his pro business policies may make it interesting the short market obviously has shown that but i would say that the upside in the us is probably not as good as upside in india now, if you don't plan ever to come to india then it may not be a very big idea to put out of money in india but if you do plan to come here absolutely great idea the repatriation is another issue a lot of people worry about repatriation and taxation so the taxation is about taxes repatriation is taking the money back to us both of them are fairly well understood i don't think there is too much ambiguity in that unless you have an inheritance if you inherit something from a resident of india when you are living in the us as a us citizen you have to go through certain um, loops to get that money back to the us but even that uh, rbi had made it fairly simple and straightforward to do that so i i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say it's as complex as it was 10 15 years ago uh, but i wouldn't necessarily say it's crystal clear and clean there are interpretations that people can make on the rules in india as well which uh, which which could be difficult well, i'll give you one example us has 401k right so 401k in us whatever money you put the returns are not taxable until after you take the money out right 401k income in the us is taxable in india believe me believe me on an annual basis any income you derive from a 401k in the us has to be reported in india income tax and you pay tax i am not paying tax on it i made a i made a letter to the it commission saying that this is a retirement income i don't even have to get every to touch it so how could i be paying tax on thing i haven't even able to touch it so i got a temporary relief from the it commission saying okay we'll evaluate your request at least they said we're not they're not saying yes or no they're saying we'll evaluate your request so this is a kind of complexity to worry about that some of the investments in one country might be looked at differently by another country tax people and vice versa but having said all that i still think i still think that uh, investments in india are definitely worthwhile for in, in terms of your uh, asset allocation you may want to consider diversifying and put some portion of your assets in, in the indian market that's what i would say great great uh, thank you sir yeah, and yeah. <clears throat> like you said uh, maybe it'd be good to even walk through maybe another session with uh, the tax uh, yeah. implications and the tax pieces that you mentioned i would love to yeah, then i'm sure there will be others as well but thank definitely. you so much sir in the yeah. long run You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Thank All right. I much uh, wish uh, for spending more than an hour with us. Uh, oh, sure. We will uh, have your name included in our stock trading ideas group. Oh, a, very nice. Very interesting group. Uh, How so, much money did you guys make out of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the people, some of the people who are here will tell you that you need to take my courses to make that money. But uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not pitching for my courses. Uh, yeah, it's a very, very good group. Okay, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, very uh, diversified uh, in terms of interest. So you're, you're most welcome. Uh, but uh, most people talk about U.S. investments. Okay. Uh, no, Mr. I, I, I'm, I'm. I see. As I said, I still have my assets in the U.S. because at some point, yeah. my half the family is there. So I thought I will have some leg there and do that. Plus, also diversification. I said diversification yes. is always a good. and hedging against currency and all that so yeah. but I, i'm interested because i still continue to invest in the us uh, and so i'd like to thank you for joining you know very coincidentally yesterday i came across a, 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 i think a facebook uh, post by somebody uh, there is a word for this they are uh, just like you're doing this end of life planning mm. the end of life decluttering exercise decluttering <laughs> so i think there is a word for this in switzerland uh, switzerland okay i i, I should uh, get out that uh, post and put it here in the group mm-hmm. so what they are doing is to 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 be as minimalist as possible slowly mm-hmm. decluttering the houses mm-hmm. so that uh, after one goes away the loved ones may not spend time trying to get rid of it okay <laughs> 
Sankaran, that's the most difficult thing. I'm uh, going to uh, delegate it to someone else. <laughs> 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 maybe i should start a start a session on psychology of retirement planning or something because yes, yes. as a psychologist like a lot of people ask me questions on a lot of topics and some older people ask me about what do i do in life after i retire yeah and and that's maybe a, a very different discussion yes. and i tell you as a psychologist most of my clients are actually not from india or from the us believe yes. me uh, because the us um, the, the the us uh, mental health professionals don't understand some of what we go through yeah, because of culture and social not differences not really mind at all <laughs> yeah, so, so so they just don't understand some of the problems we think we have and they say like why do you have the problem you shouldn't have the problem well we do <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. so that's another thing if you guys have anyone who needs help with uh, mental health that's another thing you can do so you can refer them to me and uh, to the point of uh, social work yes we do run ngos in india we're doing a lot of different work so if you guys want to contribute to our ngo uh, you are welcome to contribute to our ngo we can give you a receipt if we can't take money in us dollars because we don't have the certification for foreign currency yet we are working on it we should be getting it by first quarter of next year but until such time you are welcome to contribute in indian rupees with your accounts in india and we would greatly appreciate any donations from any of you to continue the work of uh, you know taking care of our children etc here yeah but uh, thank you for the you want to give uh, a meal uh, but please contribute yeah exactly for your exactly. birthday your spouse's birthday wedding anniversary whatever exactly exactly please do uh, contribute uh, that's uh, exactly. one small uh, request that i can make to this group on on uh, behalf of social okay? yeah yeah you can look at your our website viswa jayam i'll put it there also to see what we are doing so viswajayam.org viswa jayam if you want to get a lot more of his uh, time walk with him to uh, that's the project thing yeah we we walk october last october mid october both parents and wife we you go from chennai to tirupati by walk yeah. uh, it takes uh, four days 162 kilometers uh, we go with a bunch of people not alone uh, fantastic opportunity fantastic experience so i would uh, recommend all of you to try that it's not as difficult as it may sound it's not easy for sure but it's not as impossible as it was may think uh, it's a great opportunity to introspect when you're walking uh, and i get a lot of clarity at the end of the four days to to look back at the year that passed by to see what all things that i should not have done and and i'll tell you it definitely makes you a better person no doubt about that absolutely better person so would uh, advise you guys to try it out if you get a chance wonderful. all right wonderful thank you good night uh, okay. thank you guys and all of you guys in the us uh-huh. thanks for the opportunity bye bye we will stay in touch we will talk more about farming later okay all right <laughs> thank okay so thank, thank, thank you. you thank you thanks so much thank thanks you. everyone bye bye thank you bye yeah. thank you yeah bye guys bye i'll end the meeting now okay okay thank you, thank you.